so dear students it is a effort to address some of your concerns related to interview we have collected certain questions from the transcripts as well as certain probable questions from mock interviews and elsewhere so some uh, here a student will be asking the question and uh, i will try to tell you how you should be approaching this particular answer from my point of view fine so now let us start do you think india should withdraw its troops from the maldives given the deadline okay so the first question do you think india should withdraw its troops from maldives in a given deadline so this is an important area all of you should be appear, uh, preparing the india and the neighbors now if this is a question that should we withdraw or not always stick to the principles of foreign policy because in interview you should be talking in formal terms you cannot be talking behind the curtain thing so formally speaking our foreign policy towards the neighbors is grounded on the fundamental principles of panchashil we believe in non interference in the domestic affairs we respect the sovereignty of the state in case if maldives is asking definitely our formal official stand has to be we should be ready to withdraw but we have to see the withdrawal means it is not necessary that we have to just follow their timeline we have to see other arrangements we have to see our security concerns in the sense because we have our people there so what time india will require to withdraw in a proper sense that we can always discuss but in principle you should always be agree for withdrawal given the situations like in maldives don't we think that india is losing out in its neighborhood okay so the question is considering the situations in maldives is india losing out in neighborhood now these type of questions it should not be based on one or two events it should not be based on a very narrow view of the things so how will you address you can always say that the biggest challenge for any country's foreign policy is how to deal with the neighbors now in case of india the problem increases because of huge asymmetry in terms of size and in terms of power obviously we do not have a very friendly neighborhood also because it is not just our neighbors are here there is a huge involvement of the external powers in the region so is india losing the plot i will say no because we may have lost a battle but we have not lost the war and is still what is most important is the logic of geography if something is stands true for india that we cannot change our neighbors we can change our friends then that holds also for maldives or any country that india in terms of its size is not something that they can ignore for all time to come and i don't think that india has lost everything or we have lost all type of cards uh, we have also seen that there is a domestic resentment against uh, the president of maldives in and uh, there is a plan for bringing impeachment and these type of things so india should use a spectrum of the options means india should also use its diplomatic reach its presence its diaspora let us explore but i don't think there is any requirement or any need that india gets anxiety we have seen a trend we have seen a trend in afghanistan we have seen a trend in nepal and other countries and obviously these are the smaller smaller countries it all depends upon 
our perception, how we look at these actions of uh, the states. So, a smaller state trying to make a better bargain and of course, India is quite self-sufficient to take care of its interest. Even if the neighboring countries have the example of Sri Lanka, why do they still take a pro-China stance and not come with India or accede to India's request? Okay. So, neighboring countries have an example of Sri Lanka where Sri Lanka had to suffer a lot because of Chinese policies of land grab and non-transparent financing. The question is why other countries in the region do not take lesson. So, this particular question you can start that I can I would like to answer this question on two notes one with your permission and that is just uh, uh, for the sake of fun or humor is that at times people do not learn by their own mistakes and it means sometimes we if we do not learn from our mistakes uh, of course we hardly learn from the mistakes of others so joke apart now sri lanka learning from example of Sri Lanka because we should stay away from generalizing the things. Each country is unique. Each country has its unique national priorities. Every country has its unique relations with India as well as China. Every country has its priorities. So, they will take action. Whenever a country takes action, it is never one or two factors. So, multiple factors play the role. Hence, we cannot expect one country behaving from the way other countries because things are quite complicated. How is the domestic structure? How is the leadership? Various factors way, will play the role. Anyway, whether they learn from Sri Lanka or not, what is important is that India should stick to the fundamentals of its neighborhood policy, whether it is Panchil, whether it is Gujral, whether it is neighborhood first, because our actions should be uh, according to our size. It should be according to what suits to a great power and definitely it has to be India way. It cannot be China way. It cannot be intrusive. It cannot be uh, something that goes against Indian ethos. So, have patience. Sometimes patience is very important. It is also said that if a speech is silver, then patience is golden. So, at times, uh, we have to wait and watch and uh, once Narsimha Rao has held that not taking decision is also a decision. So, now let us not take and reach to the conclusions in hurry. Okay. Do we think that sometimes India does act like a big brother in its neighborhood? Fine. So, the question is do you think at times India behaves like a big brother in the neighborhood. Of course, there are instances where India has acted or somehow India appeared to have acted like that. For example, uh, the formal and informal blockade of Nepal. Whether we have acted or not, but this perception has been built, this narrative has been built. And at times we cannot help too much considering the huge asymmetry. So, whatever we will do, it may appear even in a, in a scenario whenever we will be taking something, talking something tough, which is not as per the convenience of the developing country or of the other neighboring countries, they are going to build the narrative. And... Uh, that is why what we have to do, we should not be giving any such chance, but there are few things which we cannot control. And again, I believe that as far as the neighbors are concerned, we should stick to our Gujral doctrine, non-reciprocity and considering the sensitivity of India's neighborhood, patience is the 
डू यू थिंक पी एम मोदीज ओपनिंग अप ऑफ राम टेम्पल इज जस्टिफाइड एंड हिज चूजिंग ऑफ द डेट ऑफ ट्वेंटी सेकेंड जैन वेन इवन वेन शंकराचार्य वर अपोजिंग इट ओके सो द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज वेदर प्राइम मिनिस्टर मोदीज इनग्रेशन ऑफ राम टेम्पल इज जस्टिफाइड और नॉट सो वाई दिस क्वेश्चन बिकॉज we generally link this question with india as a secular state but there should not be any question mark if any one who understand the nature of indian secularism our secularism is not anti religion or religious neutrality our secularism is sarva dharma sambhav now if we talk about ram temple if we talk from legal point of view it should not be seen in terms of in uh, like prime minister's action through the framework of religion because supreme court itself has held that hinduism is not a religion it is a way of life now the another thing is from my point of view ram doesn't belong to any particular religion ram is a part of our heritage ram is a representation of dharma and dharma is the very architectonic idea of indian society so let us not uh, be little ram ram is not a icon of hindutva ram is a representation of india's culture the feature of what is compassion love toleration respect for the subaltern class the weaker section so i don't think that there is any substance in the first narrative what was the second narrative about the date whether the 22nd jan was uh, a suitable date okay so as far as the date is concerned even i don't know much but uh, maybe i have not gone through but if if you know then uh, maybe uh the date has been according to the uh the tradition according to the brahmins they must have looked for the date so i think because there can be different point of views uh which is the right date but i think if if you ask my personal opinion i believe that for doing something good any time is a good time fine let's not be so fixated with this type of mentality अगर अच्छा काम है तो कोई भी समय अच्छा ही है थर्ड पार्ट ऑफ द क्वेश्चन दे वर द टू पार्ट्स नाउ मूविंग टू अनदर क्वेश्चन यू वर आस्किंग शंकराचार्य इट वाज द पार्ट ऑफ द सेम क्वेश्चन दैट शंकराचार्य वाज अपोजिंग इट अपोजिंग द डेट शंकराचार्य इज अपोजिंग बट फाइन बिकॉज़ विद इन इवन इफ वी टॉक अबाउट हिंदूइज्म वी डू नॉट सी एनी पर्सन इन सेंट्रलिटी and we don't have any centralized church hinduism is about a plurality we can have a difference of opinion mm-hmm. and maybe government what government has decided in terms of suitability in terms of administrative concerns i don't know there may be the concerns for this date obviously i can think is which are beyond the religious concern there must be administrative and other concerns maybe we are not so much aware of it yes ma'am who do you think is responsible for israel hamas war who is responsible for israel hamas war again we should not be simplifying the things as far as the immediate factor is concerned i think hamas is responsible because hamas may be thinking that uh, the issue on which their legitimacy is based is becoming uh, is losing its importance in geopolitics now the second possible uh, country which may have uh, benefited out of this is obviously china because uh, not much difference i think between the decision of imec corridor and uh, this particular action so obviously no one can say with surety but china is is there and of course uh, why not israel because up till now the final solution is yet to come and in a way i will say the entire international community is responsible because as an international community we failed 
to solve this particular dispute which is long standing and the mother of so many disputes it should have been solved long time back so i will not put a blame on one or two actors i will say it's a collective failure how long do you think that the israel hamas war can sustain giving the present scenario how long israel and uh, hamas wa war can sustain given the present scenario uh, in these type of questions you should try to refrain from hypothetical scenarios because uh, you can always say with due permission uh, i don't want to uh, talk about hypothetical situation because there is no specific uh, formula for us to tell how long the war will continue because uh, maybe once the putin has started the war he has not expected that it will continue for long so as far as in international politics is concerned the law of unintended consequences operate fine sometimes you may think uh, but i believe that uh, if you take my personal opinion uh, war should end because the war is taking the energy and the resources especially energy of us now us priorities is right now not a war in the middle east so us may take an action for reconciliation so us priorities is china us priority is russia and actually us priority is china so even us may be willing to uh, come out of the war uh from ukraine also and normally uh, what happens is these type of uh, consequential decisions come when there is a change of guards so suppose uh, a new leadership comes in usa and uh, they may make uh, these type of decisions like uh, biden made the decision for withdrawal of the troops so i believe us will make an effort that the war should subside at earliest because Uh, they have to focus on uh, the taiwan strait do you think india's support for israel and its abstention is under western pressure abstention in the un and it is against the humanitarian considerations of palestine so the question is do you think india's support to israel is under western pressure i will say no because india has always followed a policy of strategic autonomy and uh, there has been too much western pressure even in case of ukraine but we have not changed our stand so whatever stand we take this is according to our national interest it is according to our long term strategic interest for india israel matters because our security concerns like cross border terrorism building missile defense and many other areas and again uh, india's decision of any cooperation uh, any affirmative note towards israel should also be seen through india's position that we do not consider or differentiate between a good terrorism and a bad terrorism fine so india itself one of the worst sufferers we can equate this entire event with 26 11 in india and of course uh, indians are emotionally uh, emotionally impacted by any these events so multiple factors have played the role and of course the western domination is or the western pressure i will say has played the negligible role maybe india's long term friendship with israel israel support to india in the critical hour our sensitivity towards the terrorism and these type of actions may have played the role and of course uh, our stand on terrorism that stands that we do not support and of course we do not believe that violence is the solution and is it against humanitarian considerations of palestine no but uh, humanitarian considerations cannot be an excuse to uh, to create a war because uh, in this way uh, hamas or palestine uh, may have lost the legitimacy of their cause the moment you use the violence the legitimacy goes so humanitarian concerns cannot be an excuse 
all the time because you are also expected to respect the humanitarian concerns of the other. So I don't think it will impact the humanitarian concern and India has made it very clear that we make a complete segregation between the Hamas and the Palestinian people and our solidarity with them remain and we do not go for homogenization. Do you think Manipur, why do you think Manipur crisis is not yet resolved? Has the state acted in the right manner so far? Manipur crisis is yet not resolved in the sense that it is a very old issue. Entire Northeast is an old issue and a state acted in the right manner or wrong. I believe that yes, a state's action but uh, has been right enough uh, whatever state has done and uh, again we should not expect that this type of crisis which have not just the domestic angle but also the external angle will end soon especially when it is the elections time and when uh, there is so much involvement of uh, China in India's domestic affairs so any crisis any crisis, it cannot be uh, stopped in few minutes or in few hours. These are very sensitive issues as time proceeds, so it gets complicated. And again, uh, the tribal, inter-tribal rivalries are quite old and uh, quite prominent. So, so far, I believe that uh, the election time will remain it will be difficult to cover up because there are so many vested interests so one interest and it give rise to a chain of other interest and situation everybody wants to take the advantage of the situation why is russia's invasion of ukraine still going on with russia standing alone and on the other hand western nations coming in support of ukraine we know that russia's economy has been weakening but despite all of that, how is able how is Russia able to still sustain the war? So Russia is able to sustain the war primarily because of China's support. And it's not only China buying Russian oil, India is also buying Russian oil. Even Europeans are also buying Russian oil. So Russia does have the resources and uh, the major support for Russia is of course China. This is one part of the question. What was the other part of your question? How is it even sustaining? When the... It is sustaining. Russia is a great power. Russia has a capacity to sustain and uh, you cannot say that uh, experienced politician like Putin will take a very uncalculated move and uh, Russia has to sustain. They don't have a choice. It is a do and die situation because Russia cannot imagine a scenario where uh, Ukraine joins NATO or it harms very significantly if uh, EU jo uh, Russia Ukraine joins EU also. So I believe that whenever it is a do and die situation for your motherland, you will have to sustain. You have to have uh, extraordinary will, not which is not there in the normal situation. You have to bring and uh, considering Putin's background, Putin's leadership, uh, they will sustain because. I don't think that for sustaining only you require the material resources. You require lot of uh, willpower, lot of willingness to defend your interests, to defend your, your motherland. Why is Russia unflinched with Finland and now Sweden's inclusion in NATO, but it invaded Ukraine for the same reasons? Because there is a difference in Finland and Sweden because uh, they are never... Even when it was USSR, they were not part of USSR. They were uh, neutral countries because of being in neighborhood. Now, the type of uh, umbilical cord type of relationship Russia and Ukraine has cannot be compared. The two are altogether different cases. And uh, Ukraine, Russia's dependency on Ukraine for transit. And uh, Ukraine has been... Uh, 
traditionally also considered by Russia as a part of Russian Empire and uh, it is very critical for Russia's uh, energy interest which Finland is not. So, uh, Ukraine he calls it as near abroad and it matters. So, we cannot compare the two cases. Uh, can we now ask on the Indian government and politics part? So, do we even need a governor given so much of friction we are witnessing between the central and state governments and what can be done? Yeah, we need a governor because India is a federal state. You need a head of the state and frictions frictions are political in nature but political frictions cannot uh, be the basis to bring the institutional changes of constitutional nature and uh, what is to be done is you have to strengthen the democratic culture in the country this is what is expected because uh, ultimately what ambedkar has said you have to follow the constitutional morality so, as far as removing the post, none of our center state commissions have ever recommended because we need, we have a parliamentary system. What is needed is changing the practice. And if practice is not good, we cannot end up changing every institution. We need the change. We need uh, the reforms. And the most important reform is, of course, the morality as Ambedkar has held because no institution can be perfect under and unless people don't be try to act in an ethical manner. Do you think that judiciary is not held properly accountable with respect to its appointments? No, I don't think judiciary has not been held because what is the system of appointment? System of appointment, I believe that it is according to the constitution. So, constitution has never given free hand to executive. Constitution said that uh, judges will be appointed by president but after consultation with the judiciary. Why? Why judges should have a greater say? First of all, in terms of experience and it is more important to prevent judiciary from coming under the influence of executive. So, judges appointing judges is a lesser evil than the politicization of judiciary. So, until unless we do not come up with any other alternative, we should ignore the possibility of anything that goes for politicization of judiciary. Do you think there is an over centralization in Indian polity? Has the executive become stronger? So, uh, as far as the over centralization is concerned, these are very subjective terms. And if we go by our constitution, our constitution is any way uh, provides for a strong center, which some people call it quasi federal, or uh, in a more decent term, persons like Granville Austin, they call it as cooperative federalism. And uh, as Ambedkar has also held that. Uh, federation has been a administrative convenience and our long term aim has always been to evolve as a strong nation and Ambedkar has uh, also held that India is not a federation, India is a union of states. So, everywhere our constitution gives greater preference to the unity we have to evolve as a nation and uh, there, there can be other way of looking at it means centralization means strengthening india's identity as one nation after ayodhya now gyanwapi in varanasi even krishna janabhumi in mathura and even lakshman tila of lucknow will it not lead to a slippery slope if such ASI reports keep on coming and we keep on finding that there had been temples where today the mosque stand, what do you think as a way forward to it? The way forward is if there, there are genuine grievances and if there are people's aspirations, obviously as a country, every person's concern is important. Our constitution talks about respecting the human dignity. Rawls said inviolability of human dignity. We cannot say that uh, this demand is less important. We have to stop this demand. The thing is we have to, if there is a demand 
obviously we have to go scientifically towards the process we have to trust our institutions for dispute resolution you should go to the judicial route which can develop the consensus and the confidence i don't see that in democracy uh, we should fear for the slippery slope rather we should respect people's aspirations but obviously it should not be based on any vague criteria it should be based on some solid scientific criteria and uh, we should be doing justice with everyone okay fine so i think uh, we will end for today and uh, hope this uh, interaction would help you in framing your answers we'll come back with few more questions after this thank you